Hello, everyone. Welcome back from break. I hope you enjoyed those wonderful snacks. You got to stretch your legs, move a little bit. Um, hi, my name is Charles Hawthorne. I'm a fellow in addiction and overdose uh, from Oakland, California. Uh, very long flight here. Uh, I work at uh, California Bridge, a program of the Public Health Institute. At California Bridge, uh, we are working to help emergency departments all across the state and the country build substance use treatment and harm reduction programs uh, with the goal of having 24-7 access to substance use treatment and high quality care for people who use drugs. Um, I'm really excited for our next panel. Um, in my role, I help uh, advance our harm reduction and racial equity work um, and support hospitals in building that out. And I'm looking forward to our next panel uh, because uh, upcoming Supreme Court decisions have a really huge impact on the public health work we do all across the country. Laws such as the, uh, the Medical Emergency Medical uh, Treatment and Labor Act, ADA, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 have a huge impact on how hospitals operate and the care they're able to provide. And I'm really excited to uh, hear from our panelists. Please welcome journalists in residence at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Joanne Keenan, in conversation with Justice uh, William J. Brennan, Jr., professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center, Lisa uh, Hyenzerling. So Lisa, the Supreme Court um, ruled on four really landmark cases that I understood the implications for public health, or I thought I understood the implications of public health before I met you, and you told me, you know, there's a whole other layer. So one was obviously the Dobbs case, the abortion case. One was the New York State gun control, striking down the New York State law. One was the West Virginia EPA case, limiting the EPA's power to regulate fossil fuel power plants. And then the, the final one was the case saying that large employers cannot require COVID um, vaccines or the COVID test, vaccinator test policy that large employers were doing that OSHA was trying to do. So those are very different. They all have huge implications of public health. I looked at them individually. Oh, this is bad for public health. This is bad for public health. This is bad for public health. But you saw something larger. So explain. Yeah, I mean, the, the surprising and uh, disturbing thing that aligns all of these cases which are all about public health in a fundamental sense, all have enormous consequences for public health. But one of the, um, uh, the alignments among them is that the Supreme Court actually didn't engage with or really even talk about the public health consequences of those decisions. It really wasn't interested. In a couple of cases, it explicitly said that's not our job to think about those consequences. One might have said, it's not your job to do the thing you're doing without thinking about those consequences either, right? So there's a one, they're all about public health. They all refuse to engage with the serious and in many cases immediate public health consequences of the decisions. And in addition, they all deployed very assertive, I would probably say reckless, understandings of the federal constitution. Right? And so that means that they are constraints in a way that um, decisions interpreting statutes um, on their own without constitutional overtones are. Other decisions that can be redone, these cannot easily be, um, be undone. So it's not only am I going to, I as a justice, I'm going to try to time machine myself back to you know, the 1790s and figure out what the founders would have said. I am actually not going to pay attention to the real life consequences on the health and actual lives of people living in the 21st century. So um, what you've defined, um, the, there's something called the major question that you've written about, that how the Supreme Court defined a major question, and then you've also written about the minor question, <laughs> which is, I think, your coining. Um, explain what a major question is, because people are going to be hearing about this more. Yeah, I think this is really important. If, if you take one thing from this panel, is just that you might want to pay attention to what the Supreme Court is doing in all of your work, because this is an incredibly consequential uh, kind of new and new doctrine, just named, really, by the Supreme Court for the first time last June. Right? Um, and so the major questions idea is a way to interpret a federal statute. 
most federal statutes, all the ones I've heard about this morning on the federal level, um, in most of them, and all of them actually, Congress takes on a problem, infectious disease, air pollution, water pollution, you name it, and describes outlines for dealing with that problem, and then hands it to an administrative agency, the Food and Drug Administration, the EPA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and so on, to complete the work. Right? And those agencies are experts in ways that Congress isn't. They can act quickly in ways that Congress can't. And so Congress, ha their, that structure is true of almost every public health statute I can imagine and know. What the court has said is that if Congress wants to do that, if it wants to empower an administrative agency to take on an important problem in any field, outside public health too, in any field, it needs to speak clearly in giving that agency power. Right? And by clearly, it doesn't just mean that the statute literally allows the agency to do something to address a major problem that Congress has identified. It means it has to speak quite precisely about that problem as well. So to take the, uh, the vaccine or, or um, test mandate issued by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, you would think that that statute fit that like a glove. There, here was a workplace hazard that was serious, that the agency is empowered to take on serious workplace hazards. And the Supreme Court said, no, no, not clear enough. And so the, the idea that there's a plausible basis for the agency power is no longer enough. Congress needs to speak really clearly. And what's an important problem? What are the kinds of important problems that Congress um, might act on where it needs to speak really clearly? Well, here's the rub. It's the kind of problem that the conservative justices on the Supreme Court think is really too big too big for an agency hand, to handle without crystalline, clear language from Congress. And you're probably thinking, oh, there must be something more to it than that, right? Is there something more to it than that? Yeah, the, the court mentioned a couple of factors in each of the cases. The statutes, in many cases, were fairly old. Uh, the agency was acting in a new and creative way, right? But the bottom line is, it's called the major questions doctrine because of the importance of the, of, of the issues. And, um, and those are important because of economic and political considerations that are quite subjective. So is this thing Congress can fix? We we're out of time, but yes, no. Is this easy for Congress to fix? No. No. <laughs> you could have guessed. That's right. the problem, too. Can I just take one second to say, to say why? In theory, sure, they can. Sure, they can fix it, but they need to be super clear in a way that's obvious to them when they act, which might be years before the Supreme Court decides any case involving it. And again, the structure of the public health laws that you really care about is to take a problem in advance, identify it, state the factors relevant to the agency, and then empower them to act even when it emerges suddenly, and to create solutions that are resourceful and new. And those are the things that the Major Questions Doctrine really dis uh, disempowers Congress and the agencies from doing. Well, that's all the time we have.